Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions. Responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty. You want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're always glad to have this returning guest. He's a heartwarming source of wit and wisdom. Joel Salatin is the co-founder of Polyface Farms, a teaching farm in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. He's also a widely sought-after speaker and author, all-around coach on permaculture, integrity food. He's, he's talking about what needs to happen so that we can get back to uh, trusting our food supply. Joel, thanks for joining us again on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you, Don. Again, it's, uh, it's great to be here. We talked with you last time in November of 2018 about ridiculous regulations and romaine recalls. We were in the throes of a multiple nationwide recalls, not only affecting romaine lettuce, but a lot of other foodstuffs that turns out uh, were such large-scale recalls that they affected many, many uh, brands and, and stores and uh, consumers all over the country. And people wondering, uh, what about uh, why aren't we being protected about the safety of our food supply, that sort of thing. And you talked about some practices. So folks, check that out. Ridiculous regulations and romaine recalls. But sp speaking of regulations, do we have any reason for hope of reduced regulations or any return to sanity uh, given the new administration and their uh, their at least the platform they ran on was for enabling small businesses through reducing regulations and, and that sort of thing? Uh, or are we or is the trajectory just we're going to stay in the grips of big agra um, forever? W what are you seeing in mega trends about r new regulations? Yeah, well, it's interesting that there are there are definitely some trends in states. Uh, individual states are certainly taking some uh, some leadership. Uh, what what is kind of loosely you know loosely um, uh, titled cottage cottage food laws. Mm -hmm. Um, and and it's exactly what it implies. It, uh, states are uh, Utah has it. Um, I think Montana, uh, Maine tried to move forward with what was called a food sovereignty law, which was the most aggressive of all of these. And the USDA pretty much uh, shut that down. Uh, um, but but there, there are numerous efforts uh, and and. So state, not not the federal. The federal, for sure, is still, I think, very much headed toward the, you know, toward the tyranny, <laughs> the tyranny end of the spectrum. But hmm. but definitely, numerous states have um, have tried to reduce some of the regulatory constraints on um, on access. <clears throat> the the big problem is in is in uh, meat and poultry and dairy. Which are heavily regulated by the federal, and uh, uh, as opposed to things like jams and jellies and stuff, and, and a lot of these cottage industry laws are essentially taking taking um, a lot of the regulatory burden, what I call uh, uh, scale prejudicial regulations, off of what are known as low ha low hazard foods. Low mm -hmm. hazard foods are things like, well, for example, in Virginia, uh, four years ago. Uh, Virginia, we got a law, we got a, a freedom through um, that that uh, non-temperature sensitive baked goods can be um, baked in your home and sold to an end user. You can't sell them to Kroger's, but you can you can bake them in your home and sell them to an end user. The person who's going to eat the eat it, and you can do as much of that as you want with no government regulation whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So. Um, now you can't you can't do custards and you can't do you can't do lemon meringue pie chocolate pie because those are those are temperature sensitive things. Okay. Um, I mean, <laughs> if you start going into parsing, you know these kind of nuances, uh, boy, we can really go down a rabbit hole. But 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 the point is that roughly three years ago, 
we carved out this wonderful thing where you could make you know donuts and cakes and and, and biscuits and bread and, and this in your home sell it to neighbors as much as you want no limit on volume uh with 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 no um with no inspection at all and the reason is because they're extremely low hazard uh we just tried this general assembly to get a yogurt bill in to allow you to do yogurt there has never um since since we've had recalls and whatever um you know uh, regulations there has never been a recall there's never been a a sickness uh from yogurt because it's a cultured and it's a it's a heated it's a heated cultured product hmm. so uh you know if it's if it's bad it won't culture it won't <laughs> turn into yogurt and so uh so it becomes its own kind of inherent thing and um and of course the Virginia Farm Bureau I uh, immediately sent out a thing that said we were asking for raw milk. We weren't asking for raw milk. We were asking for yogurt, just yogurt. And, um, and of course, the, it, it got killed, I think, four to seven in agriculture uh, committee. So we didn't succeed there. We, you know, we don't succeed on very many of these. But, but, but the point is, in numerous states, whether it's uh, pickles or um, uh, like some states have, have caps on pickles, in Virginia, we, you can do $3,000 worth of pickles a year in your home kitchen without inspection and sell them to end users, to friends and family and, hmm. and acquaintances. Um, you know, it's not a huge business, but, but, but it's, it's more than we had four years ago where you couldn't do one, you know, one single pickle. <laughs> and and, and uh, so, you know, so we're seeing those chips, if you will, the, the chipping away of the, um, of, of the food slavery regulatory environment we're seeing a chipping away of that in in states. I think the general tra- the general trajectory is not positive on the federal level. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's still very much you know in the and, and, and what's pushing this is not industry. What's mm. pushing it is consumer advocacy. The people that that want that want protection from the government. You know, and Ben Franklin said, if you're willing to give up your freedoms for security, uh, you get neither and you deserve neither. And um, and and he was exactly right. And so so the the burdensome regulatory environment that we have has been primarily a consumer advocacy issue. Um, you know, not a, not an industry driven hmm. thing. What happens is consumers are scared, so they want quote unquote oversight. And so then legislation gets made. But if you know you know the two rules of things you're not supposed to see made. One is sausage, and one is legislation. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so so the thing is, with all good intent, by the time the legislation actually gets made, it runs through all this, um, you know, the the sieve, if you will, of the industrial community, which then, by the time it gets made, it becomes you know prejudicial against small operations. Mm-hmm. And, concessionary toward big ones it's just the, it's just the name way the way it goes so I, I don't i don't see a trend line there but i do see a lot of things happening in states and it's very exciting you mentioned utah montana in particular if people are actually interested in strategic relocation to a community that's more likely to be supportive of food integrity are there any other states at the top of your list that come to mind oh by far and away the the freest state is missouri hmm Missouri is the, is by far and away the freest state. I mean, they don't even have uh, they don't even have uh, uh, zoning, um, and, and and a lot of you know some of these are not necessarily food regulations. They're they're local zoning regulations. I mean, like you know here in our county, um, it's it's illegal for me to cut a to cut a tree and mill it on my own bandsaw mill and make a chair and sell it to a neighbor. Because that's manufacturing, which is illegal in an agriculture zone, mm. and so, uh, so you have, you know, you have these, uh, a lot of times, you know, pretty specific kinds of uh, prohibitions on things that often are, are literally local, not mm. you know, not state or federal, but yeah, but for sure, I mean, Missouri, you can sell, you sell all the raw milk you want uh, without any regulations. Mm. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, yeah. Missouri tops the list. Um, the one negative about Missouri is, though, that because it is so free, there's a fairly saturated, um, you know, uh, farming. If you go there to do direct market something, 
um, you're going to have a lot of competition because the freedom allows a lot of competition. So people who I know who are doing this, uh, you know, direct direct marketing, direct farm marketing in Missouri, I think have a little more trouble than other places because there are so many people doing it. And it's not a heavily populated state. Well, we'll, we'll circle back on those points because I wanted to, to follow up with you about some the distribution revolution later, and maybe that will be changing the game on that one. Um, because if yes. you start talking about a national market and that sort of thing, yeah, um, that is changing the game. Yeah. Uh, another thing that's you <laughs> you mentioned uh, oversight. Um, one, some people are concerned right now, again from a consumer advocacy standpoint, about lack of oversight due to the partial government shutdown. We're we're doing this interview right now on uh, Wednesday, January twenty third, two thousand nineteen. It's day thirty three of the partial government shutdown over uh, the border wall controversy and so on. But the question is, we saw a news story talking about uh, you might want to stick with only food providers and food sources and brands that you're especially familiar with because of the reduced amount of government food inspectors that are going to be out there if they're not getting paid, that sort of thing. Um, I'm really con curious about your take on are there specific types of food to avoid due to the increased risk from reduced government inspectors or is this an example of maybe a blessing in disguise of, of less big brother oversight uh, right now well i guess i guess a lot of that depends on uh, on whether um on whether you have faith in the inspection system uh i don't have much faith in the inspection system i i see it pretty much as a the inspection system as a way to put small outfits out of business and concessionize big ones, and big ones get by with murder, and little ones, if you if you have one tear in a in a door screen, suddenly the you know the the building shut down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, uh, and and I own a you know a co co own a uh, a federal inspected slaughterhouse, so I'm not just talking out of the top of my head here. I'm I'm I'm, I'm telling you that uh, that the yeah, uh, uh, they don't make food safer um, mm. as a general rule. Uh, what they do is kind of legalize, um, you know, legalize um, cleverness <laughs> in, in a lot of ways. Now, now that's not <clears throat> that's not to say that there aren't there aren't infractions and there is no good there. I don't want to paint too broad a brush here, but I don't think. I don't think uh, for a minute that anyone is suffering. This, this is the, this is the same uh, fear mongering or paranoia that's, you know, you're, you're every day now in the newspaper we're seeing these poor federal workers that are, uh, you know, selling their clothes and they're down in food soup lines and and da 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 and and and, um, and so. Uh, uh, I think we're. I think that the the opposition. I'll use that word broadly. The opposition is is pulling out all the stops to um, to scare people uh, into uh, into thinking that you know we're all going to die mm -hmm. if if we don't get this mm -hmm. shutdown done. And mm -hmm. of course, the shutdown is all about. Republicans retreating and Democrats winning the day, and um, and I don't want to get in a big discussion about the wall mm -hmm. and all that stuff. I, I I'm actually kind of ambivalent about that, um, but but I do think I do think that there is a concerted effort from the from the um, liberal uh, camp to scare Americans into thinking that. You know we're all going to perish mm -hmm. <laughs> because these eight hundred thousand federal workers aren't pushing papers and checking boxes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, uh, so that that's one thing. The second thing, and 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 so that's that's one that's one thread. I would say the second thread is if there's ever been a time to, um, I mean if. If you are concerned about that, let, let's say that you are concerned. You've maybe read a couple of reports, and wow, you know this is concerning. Well, then there's never been a better time to to opt out of the industrial food system. Get to know your and, supplier, and, yeah. and either yeah, go to farmers markets or go and and do what you know what peak prosperity says we should do, 
and and that is to um, you know to develop our own independent uh, wealth streams. One of which includes do-it-yourself food, which may be growing it yourself or at least procuring it yourself, um, shortening the chain of custody between your plate and the farm. Mm -hmm. Anything you can do to shorten that chain of custody is going to create more transparency in the system. And more accountability and reduce risks because there's, there's risks at every handoff. And Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, all these, all these recalls, I mean, there was just one, um, uh, there was one not a few days ago, 20 million pounds of uh, beef or something. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, these come just routinely. But you, you never see a recall from a farmer's market. You never see a recall from a, a little, you know, direct market uh, community kind of situation. There are all these massive, as you mentioned, you know, uh, you look at the recall mm -hmm. and there's like, you know, eight brands, and you realize, well, my goodness, all of them are coming out of the same mm -hmm. tube. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, and you realize there's really no difference. You look at the shelves in the supermarket, and it's all coming from the same door. And so, so uh, what a what a great time to um, you know to start building uh, you know transparency and true security where you actually. You know, know know where your food comes from, whether you grow it or whether you procure it. And uh, you know, when you say that, people often they, they just suddenly they just shut down. Oh, I don't have time. I don't have you know, da, 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 da. I have all this to do. And the thing is, if you you know if you want a different outcome in your life, you've got to do something different. And mm -hmm. so you got to turn off the TV. Mm -hmm. You know, put down People magazine and maybe not go to a, a, a soccer game for your four-year-old three hours away and put a little of attention on building uh, true food wealth and food security. You know, I didn't think about this uh, question until just now, but it, you've just, you just connected with something when you talked about um, higher quality or higher integrity food producers. Uh, several years ago in the U.S., the big uh, scare was mad cow disease. And right. my wife and I just returned from international travels to Germany uh, last month. And uh, at the time of the U.S. and Canada being affected by that uh, mad cow scare and uh, there was a scandal, there was uh, some comments from some European meat producers saying, uh, we don't have that problem here because if you take proper care of your animals and have clean operations, you don't and feed them proper food. You don't you don't have that problem. Um, how much is this a are these uh, food integrity issues truly U.S. Uh, corporate greed problems, or how much of these are not seen, or are they seen also at that same scale in Europe or other or other countries? Are other places ahead of us in terms of food integrity? Uh, yes, other places are ahead of us in food integrity. I don't think there's any question about that. From uh, you know the U.S. the U.S. leads the world in in, for example, subtherapeutic feeding of antibiotics. We we developed that. We you know we invented it, if you will, and 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 pushed on that envelope. We um, you know in the U.S. we're still feeding uh, chicken manure to cows. Uh, I mean, I have a neighbor that does it. I mean, it's done uh, it's done throughout. So that means the cows are eating dead chickens and feathers and stuff. Um, you know, in the Netherlands, in, in Europe, uh, like Netherlands, I've been to Netherlands, I don't know what, six, seven times, and it's the most intensively farmed, it's the most intensive agriculture in Europe. Hmm. So if you want to see the most you know, intensive thing going on in Europe, you go to the Netherlands. And, um, and almost nothing is on pasture, which that's what I'm, you know, I, I promote. Uh, animals mm -hmm. being outside on pasture, everything's in a house. It's all brought to them, and they have a, they have a real problem with manure and things like that. But here's the di here's the difference. I don't like all of their confinement houses. In fact, and animals inside. But the main difference between them and the U.S. is scale. So we have so we have a house with twenty thousand chickens. They have a house with five, and. And you know, look, scale is not everything, but there is there is a scale factor in these kinds of things. And um, my own little unscientific formula for animal stress, and you could even 
you could even add in there people stress if you mm-hmm. want to. Uh, stress is is mass times density times time. Okay, so um, so all three factors. In other words, total mass, total density, total time. In other words, if you take two chickens and put them at a pretty a pretty tight density, let's say you put them in a in a big dog carrier and have them in your house. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to feed them your table scraps and get a couple eggs a day. All right, that's dense, but because it's only two chickens, there's no mass. There's no stress there whatsoever. It's two two chickens. They're you know they're as happy as can be. Um, uh, now, if you if you take those chickens and you um, reduce their density way down tight, like in a chicken crate. All right, well now there's no stress until they're in there for a period of time. Hmm. And, and so there's a time factor in stress. So, uh, five, I mean, it, it, uh, look at it this way. Let's say you've got, a, you've got a party at your house, and your house is full. It's Christmas. You know, and all the family's there, friends. You've got this Christmas party going on. Pretty densely populated mm-hmm. in the house. Mm-hmm. Well, there's no stress there. It's a, it's a fun party. But if suddenly all the doors locked and, a, and some loudspeaker came in and said, okay, everybody has to stay in here for a week like this, mm-hmm. <laughs> Suddenly, you know, there's there's some stress. Yeah, uh, uh, Ben Franklin said, "Fish and visitors smell in three days." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and 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 by the same token, if you have that level of people density in your house, uh, yeah, it's not that big deal. But if you had that level of people density in a in a football stadium, mm-hmm. um, that's when you have you know stampedes. You know, if, if something happens fire, whatever, that's when you have, in your house, everybody runs for the exits and gets out. In a football stadium, you know, you're going to have people trampled to death, there's going to be, you know, goal posts are going to be, uh, you know, torn apart, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's a different thing. And so, so um, uh, the thing about Europe is that not only do they, um, do they have you know, smaller, I think they have smaller operations, but they have a lot of they have prohibitions on um, on, for example, subtherapeutic antibiotic use and things like that, uh, hormone use that we mm-hmm. don't have in this country. So in the U.S., we we lead the we lead a quote unquote lead the world in kind of industrial mechanical um, production systems mm-hmm. and. And as a result, uh, there's a reason why we are the we are the nation, for example, in our hospitals that has MRSA and C diff, which are superbugs. They're superbugs created by you know, antibiotic use in in, um, in animals. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that we use twice as many pharmaceuticals in domestic livestock in the U.S. as we do in people's over the you know drug counter. It's and crazy. I can't let C. diff go by without chiming in on a, on a personal anecdote because I, I received a colonoscopy uh, about three, f- four weeks ago, and I contracted C. diff from getting the colonoscopy no. after having been warned by my wife in an article that even, and from our doctor, that even properly cleaned, quote unquote, properly, whatever that means, according to protocol, clean uh, yeah. colonoscopes there- can, in fact, infect people with all and now my wife today gave me another article that says it can be a lot worse than that there's aids and other things you can get from from a colonoscopy so but i i was in a, i was just the sickest i have ever been i believe in my life for about for about four days there uh almost no it was over a week fevers and and chills and headaches and ramp uncontrollable diarrhea and everything finally got uh to a herbal apothecary this is when we were in germany finally after i caught it here uh and i uh, got some blue malva blossom flowers and made some strong tea as as directed by the uh, apothecary lady herbalist and uh, it cured me up oh. in about three days with plus a bunch of probiotics but oh my gosh i thought i was done for it was yeah, tough yeah all that that stuff that stuff is nasty and if you're if you have a real compromised immune system you know if you're if you're elderly or something yeah. it, it, it can be fatal uh plenty of people actually you know don't don't survive uh and and that is an absolute you know, uh, man-made, human-caused um, disease. So, 
you know, there are places where, you know, it's fun to be number one in the world. You know, we'd love to have, the, you know, the, the number one, whatever, you know, basketball yeah. team or the number Foam one finger, Olympic yeah. team or the number one, <laughs> you know, the number one marathon runner, whatever. Yeah, it's fun to be number one. But, but being number one in the world in, in uh, these kinds of things, in, 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 in chronic, um, chronic non-infectious diseases, um, and we lead the world in all five um, chronic non-infectious diseases. You know, um, type two diabetes, heart disease, um, uh, what are the others? Cancer. Uh, cancer. Okay. Uh, you know, we lead the world in these things, and so that's not a place to be number one. And and I would suggest it doesn't take a rocket scientist to to appreciate that since we since we led the world in developing, <laughs> you know, Velveeta cheese, TV dinners, and, you know, and 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 and. Um, uh, eliminated butter and lard. I mean, France never eliminated butter. They still eat butter, you know, mm-hmm. and lard, mm-hmm. um, and and nobody's fat. Uh, but we, you know, we for fifty. Yeah, years morbid obesity was the other one you meant. You didn't mention, yeah. Yeah, not yeah. contagious. And, and, and you know, we we did a we did a you know a fifty year uh, jihad basically on um, on on butter and lard, and told people to eat hydrogenated vegetable oil, and. Um, and, and you know, and and here's what we've got as a result. And so, you know, we we led the world in development of you know of of chemicals and pesticides and herbicides and things like that. And so, uh, the the truth is that in those older cultures, those older countries, and I don't know how much of it is it's because they're older, um, and we just thought that we could get by with everything. I don't know, but anyway, those older cultures. And I've been all through Europe. In fact, I'm going to. Uh, two tours through Europe uh, this this spring, and I've been through all through there, and and their their food culture, their agri the culture of agriculture, um, they they actually think about boundaries. They think about well, should we? You know, in our country, we just ask, can we? And it doesn't matter. We don't ask, should we? We just say, can we? And if we can, we do. And then we end up, you know, uh, having the consequences of of our innovation. Uh, my dad used to call this overrunning your headlights. We're we're so creative as humans, we can you know we can invent things that we can't spiritually, emotionally, uh, mentally, or physically metabolize. So we invent something, and then we spend the next two generations trying to um, trying to fix the problem that mm-hmm. our invention created. Mm-hmm. And, and and I'm certainly not against inventions, but we but we do if if we don't ask. Should we on an invention? Uh, then we've created, a, you know, um, uh, an amoral, an amoral whatever trajectory, and that's a pretty scary thing. Mm-hmm. And the strange thing is, uh, nowadays we're not even encouraged to think critically about what you just described. You're talking about a moral dimension, which is absolutely uh, critical, but also just the logical dimension of it. Uh, we have people out there racing for the cure against cancer all the time, and we don't, don't bother to stop and think. Wait a minute, this isn't a contagious illness. What changed? If if we if we have now rampant you know, rates of of cancer compared to the past, what are, right. what are we doing differently? So, um, hey, I wanted to circle back on one of the questions you uh, talked about earlier. Uh, w- without dealing with the politics behind the p- t- proposed border wall on the, on the U.S.'s southern border, can we look at it just from a food system or food? Uh, supply perspective and say can the u.s food supply even survive a border wall Uh, my wife and i used to live in uh, minnesota and even up that far north that's about as far as you can get from the southern border um there was significant concerns about undocumented immigrants uh working the farms around us that sort of thing so it's an issue i'm guessing nationally it's a question it's something that people are concerned some are concerned about more than others but would our whole food supply basically come to its knees if in fact the flow of uh undocumented uh workers was was cut off through a physical barrier that's a that's an, a very interesting question I guess my, I think there would be a hiccup. For sure, there would be a hiccup. Now, how dramatic would be the hiccup? Um, let, let me put it this way. If that actually did happen, if that actually did happen, you would see a relaxation of um, where these, these H-2 or, you know, these, these temporary work visa things mm-hmm. that, that, that they get, um, you would see a, a, an immediate um, 
liberalization of those permits so that people people could come in legally and and listen i'm no fan of illegal uh Im- i mean if if you don't have if you don't have a uh, a border you don't have a country i mean that's i'm i'm kind of a believer of that um and 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 i think the 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 problem with this whole issue has been it's been construed into um anti-immigration when actually it's it's anti-illegal immigration right. it, it and and that conflates the the argument and um and so I think that we would have, I think that actually, if we got control of the border, by whatever means, if it did affect the price of food, and it might certainly, you know, quickly, these big companies and the big processors, the big canneries, the, the uh, big food, goodness, uh, uh, big restaurants, restaurants, I mean, you go to any um, significant sized restaurant and half of the folks back in the mm-hmm. kitchen mm-hmm. Um, are you know are, are immigrants are not That's right. and, and, and 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 I am absolutely not a xenophobe I, I don't mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I don't uh, go for that at all I don't mean laugh at ethnic jokes but but there is a difference between legal and not legal mm-hmm. and and um, I really believe that if we got control of the border uh, we would see a a we would see a a huge increase in permissions for legal entry because the hospitality industry you know the mm-hmm. the hotels the restaurant industry the the agriculture industry um, would not abide the inability to get um, you know to get those workers because. As long as we have our welfare state in America, Americans aren't going to do those things. Uh, I don't know how many people I talk to that, you know, hey, if you want somebody to really work, you, know, you get a, you get somebody from Asia, you get somebody from Latin America. You know, those people know how to work, and uh, and Americans have become. You know, as a general rule, you know we've we've become very soft. We've, our luxury, our luxury is to our detriment, and we're we've become uh, complacent and soft in our luxury. I wonder if we could return back to a topic that we uh, brushed on at the beginning when you were talking about uh, certain states that are more uh, small producer friendly, and uh, you mentioned Missouri, for example, but some others as well. Um, and then you mentioned, yeah, but it's that means they've attracted a lot of those kinds of small businesses, so you've got a lot of local competition. That's certainly the case when you're thinking about your market being primarily local. Um, my wife and I are recently uh, empty nesters here with our with our youngest uh, son having just graduated from college. Actually, we had two graduate the same year. And so we've, oh, been, we've been selling off a bunch of stuff, big stuff of trying to thin out our house and that sort of thing. And uh, and it makes a big difference whether you post it locally on your little, you know, neighborhood email list or on the local Craigslist, or if you put it on eBay and you got a national audience, you know, looking at your stuff. So, uh, what is this new? You you talked a little bit with me about a distribution revolution, and how we've got some a potential revolution coming in the way that food is distributed, to kind of like the Uberization of the food supply to break down those barriers that have been erected by a mega supermarket model between integrity food producers and their customers. Can you talk to us more about that? What what possibilities sure. that opens up? Yes. Yes. Well what what's happened? I mean anybody that's that's uh, you know, up up with anything is well aware of uh, of the Amazon revolution. And uh even as Luddite as I am, uh, you know, we, we actually get stuff on on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, our, of course, we're, you know, we're older, but, uh, you know, our, our daughter-in-law is on a, is on automatic, uh, automatic refresh every, every month, uh, toilet paper gets delivered to her house, 
here, you know, here on the farm, our son and daughter-in-law, uh, you know, and, and, and Teresa and I look at each other and say, what, you get toilet paper on Amazon? Yeah, I don't even mm-hmm. have to order. You know, it's on, a, it's on an automatic reorder. You know, every month it just shows up. And, and this whole, uh, you know, millennial convenience thing of a uh, 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 doorstep and, and, um, and the, the, the logistics, the cost, the cost of distribution um, has just plummeted over the last 20 years. Okay. And not only the cost, but the efficiency of it, how fast things can go from one place to another. Uh, and so what that has done, it, is, it has opened up, um, it has opened up wider market opportunities for farms who want to have a brand name, who want a direct market, who want to, who want to get the value-added amount of the middleman hats. You know, farmers, we sit around and we say, oh, well, the middleman makes all the money. Well, I've always said, well, if that's where the money is, I want to be one. Yeah, I raise my hand and say, hey, you know, if that's where the money is, I want to be one. Uh-huh. Um, but 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 when you when you have a uh, when you have an, an area in which you have a burgeoning number of direct market farms, branded branded farms, you know, X Y Z and and everything uh, serving because remember, most people, you know, we still haven't tipped over everybody most people are still going to the supermarket Mm -hmm. and so you know people who eat their food from sheets are not interested in in direct market farms uh whether you know whether it's via a farmer's market a csa or whatever well what's happened is i mean in fact the usda right now is doing a report on the flatlining of farmers markets uh the farmers markets are flatlined Sales are flatlined, numbers are flatlined, everything's mm. flatlined. And one of the big reasons is because of Walmart Organics. And so as industrial, as, as industrial organics enter mm. Martins and Kroger's and Walmart, uh, when, when Walmart became the world's number one organic vendor, that, that was a, a shot across the bow of the entire local food movement. And I can't tell you how many local food type farmers like we are um i've run into now who are who are struggling it, it's a it's a new context it's a it's a new thing i mean we're we're actually struggling with it i mean we you know people who live 10 miles away say well why should i come to your farm and buy beef when i can uh click on a computer in my jammies in the bedroom and in three days it shows up in a box on my front porch mm-hmm. um and, and so so the the efficiency of distribution is a game changer for all of the historic um, food interfaces that you and I have grown up with, and and we can either sit and say, "Oh no, this is a terrible thing," or you can say, "Wow, all right, well we can uh, we can embrace this." And so there are now. Um, there are now numerous services that, that offer software, so you can do internet sales. So you can have an internet shopping cart, uh-huh. even as a very, very, very small farm. Uh, that you can you can just immediately they they will actually you sign up and they will become your your platform, okay? And they take a commission off of sales, and but but it, but it's a way. It's essentially a. Um, you know, a, a local, uh, it's essentially an eBay for, you know, a, a farm to be able to access somebody as long as you, as long as you can ship. Now, <clears throat> you can't ship vegetables. It's hard to ship fruit. Uh, those guys, yeah, they're all water. They're, they, they don't take bouncing very well. Uh, packaging gets pretty tough. And so those things are, are, are not easy. But, but everything that can, that can take some bouncing, you know, um, Pepperoni, hot dogs, uh, uh, frozen meat, poultry, cheese, um, uh, you know, jerky, you know, uh, uh, those kinds of things are seeing just a a uh, revitalized opportunity for um, for going beyond local in sales and reaching out. So a place like Missouri that has so many of these little farms 
can actually access people in, you know, Illinois or in, mm-hmm. in New York, whatever, and, um, and, and can market to them. And so uh, this, is a, you know, this is a good thing, I think. And it's a, it's a new way to direct market to the consumer uh, and, and, and go in, tap into a larger pool of potential uh, consumers. Because the truth is still, no matter you know, what we say here, um, probably you know, probably less than 10% of the population is really what we'd call, you know, concerned about food. And, um, and that, you know, that's still a pretty small, still a pretty small number. I mean, the average American still, you know, if there's beer in a fridge, the Kardashians on the front page of People magazine and NFL's on TV, you know, life is good. That's about all that, that's about all that matters. (laughs) And so, uh, so it's going to take some time to grow this. And so the penetration, the market penetration that we're now able to get with efficient distribution is, uh, is very exciting for, uh, for entrepreneurial direct market farms that want to scale and that want to, you know, that want to uh, get some economies of scale and move forward. They're not confined now to just what they can get to, you know, in a, in a couple of hours. Now they can they can broaden their reach and go ahead and scale and and um, and get some economies that they haven't enjoyed before. I had to think about that when you were talking about uh, this nationwide phenomenon um, about how much I, I, whether you've done any or seen anybody who's done any modeling on whether this the the um, carbon footprint or the environmental benefit is better or worse when you go from the sp- sort of the spoken hub mega store model where, where everything is shipped to these big distribution centers and then shipped to the supermarkets and the customers just drive from their local neighborhood to the, co- to the grocery store or where so many people are from their home <laughs> in their jammies ordering their meat and their whatever themselves and it's getting all these trucks on the highway or but are bringing it across the country from the producers to them. Do you know if either one of those models yeah. is, is a clear yeah, winner that, in terms that, of environmental yeah, impact? Yeah. Yeah, that that carbon footprint model has been uh, researched. It's being researched uh, aggressively right now. And I'll, the, the quick answer is that it depends. It depends on how far and how much. So uh, one of the interesting ones that I was aware of was a guy in Virginia who was shipping nationally, and he was using a uh, a freezer warehouse in Kansas City, which is kind of in the middle of the country. And then shipping out from there. So let's say you know I live in I live in uh, Stanton, Virginia, which is 100 miles away from Richmond. Let's say that somebody in Richmond orders uh, orders beef for me. Okay, it's a smaller carbon footprint for if I can send a tractor trailer at a time to Kansas City, and then and then send a box back UPS to Richmond. That's a smaller footprint than if the person from Richmond comes to the farm and gets that box. Now, if the person from Richmond comes to the farm and gets six boxes, you know, let's say they get a whole, it's going to get a half a beef and 40 chickens and, you know, uh, whatever, 10 dozen eggs. You know, they get a, a yeah. they buy for like six months, all right? Then that carbon footprint is smaller. All right. So, so it, it really depends on distance and volume per trip. But for sure, for sure, the spoken wheel idea, uh, the hub, I mean, it's what the airports use, right? Yep. And, and, and the hub idea for distribution, for fulfillment centers, um, what, what we're seeing now, I mean, for example, as of 1st of November, you can now get our stuff. I mean, we're in Virginia. You can get polyface beef in Hollywood, all right? And right now, that's being sent. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you how this works. It's being sent on a tractor trailer, a refrigerator tractor trailer, from our slaughterhouse right here in, in uh, Virginia, sent to a fulfillment center in Wisconsin. And that's where all the boxes are packed and they're shipped out from there. Now, that is very, very inefficient because if it goes a long distance, it needs dry ice with it. Which creates a crazy, a crazy amount of, of cost. Yep. So 
the, the outfit that we're working with on this, it's called Farmer's Box, um, that outfit is already looking for, um, in fact, I, I meet with them uh, Thursday uh, with a realtor. We're looking for a fulfillment center here in Stanton to service essentially the East Coast. We're looking for one maybe in Indianapolis to serve the Midwest, one in um, Los Angeles to serve there, and one in New York to serve New York, so that from here, if we send pallets only, no boxes, but just palletfuls that can go on a refrigerated truck to fill that that's already going, or maybe even fill a truck in the future if, if, if it gets to be that scale. Um, the point is, when you go on a tractor trailer and you ship, um, the, that cost of distribution has just dropped and dropped and dropped over the years. Uh, you know, it used to be, if you think about it, when you were going down the interstate just uh, 10 years ago, a lot of trucks were empty. Huh. And you notice today you don't see you see almost no empty trucks. Why? Because the the computer logistics to be able huh. to eliminate deadheading on yeah. on distribution has almost eliminated empty trucks going anywhere. And and that that just in and of itself has greatly changed the cost of distribution. Goodness, uh, FedEx, UPS, you know the big the big uh, carriers, Amazon, they now have software so that you. So the, the the guy, the local distribution guy, the little uh, you know panel truck, comes around to your doorstep. They can plug in. They can plug in the addresses for the day, and the software spits out a route to them, so that they never have to make a left hand turn. All they do is make right hand turns. That right there has, I think, I'm under, I'm right on this, has saved them something like. 20 to 30 percent of their entire distribution energy costs, just that that software. <laughs> that that's the level of sophistication in the distribution system, and why it's competing so aggressively with the bricks and mortar interface. They don't have to maintain a bathroom. They don't have to worry about handicapped parking, handicapped access. They don't have to worry about somebody suing them because a light burned out in the back, you know, uh, on aisle 15, and somebody couldn't see the banana peel on the floor. I mean, all of these, oh, they don't have to run a cash, cash register. Everything's, you know, electronic. And so the, the advantage that the supermarket had is, is fast declining. In fact, it may be that it's already gone and they just don't know it. But that's why Walmart's now doing door-to-door delivery. They're putting parking spots in front, so now you order online. Somebody runs around the, in, the, in the shelves, picks up, your, picks up your bags, and when you pull up to the door, they bring it out to you. I mean, I'm saying, you, mean, you really don't have any time to go in there and get your bag, of, you know, get your Kleenex and your toilet paper? All, no, you know, it, it's convenience. And, and the fact is that the electronic revolution, the, e, the e-revolution, has has so dropped the cost of that distribution, logistics, and, and, and transportation that the, 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 um, the aggregation, the physical aggregation in the supermarket at bricks and mortar to aggregate the product there and to aggregate the customers there, that is being aggregated, both the customer and the product is being aggregated in cyberspace. Right, and that way you don't have to carry the inventory either. That's right. And worry about carry the inventory. Shelf, right. Right, shelf length. Well, Joel, that's all the time we've got for tonight, so thanks so much, as always, for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you very much. When people want to find out more of your work at Polyface Farms, where can they do that? Uh, just our website, Polyface Farms, P-O-L-Y-F-A-C-E, Farms. And it'll pop right up, and there's a wealth of information on our website. I've seen a list of your speaking topics and the books that you've published and the, the projects you've got going. So, uh, again, people, check that out at polyfacefarms.com, and Joel, we'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Look forward to it. Take care. They say the stock market crashed today. Yeah, I heard that. Sounds like people's retirement accounts and savings accounts are going to get bailed into the banks. Yeah. Looks like pension plans and social security are going to get suspended too. 
I know. Sure, I'm glad we decided to put our money into gold and silver instead. Me too. Get your first ounce of silver at spot price and free shipping on any order over $99 at sdbullion.com rp. Hey, Reluctant Preppers. If you haven't heard, we've already started our monthly one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle thank you gift to one active Patreon subscriber each month, signed by your host, Dunnigan Kaiser. And you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctantpreppers. preppers.